So um, this time uh, we're going to talk about incremental parsing with neural networks, so incremental generation of tree structures with neural networks. Um, and we're going to there's a lot of different types of trees that you can make, and we're going to talk about two different varieties, uh, syntax trees and semantic trees. And um, the syntax trees, uh, with respect to syntax trees, there's two kind of widely used varieties. Uh, one is with respect to dependencies, which focus on the relations between words. So we have like uh, saw being a verb, and then we have uh, I uh, on the left side connecting to this girl and uh, with. So this is basically uh, pointing out where the subject and the object in a propositional phrase corresponding to saw um, are in the sentence. Um, this can be used to express syntax. It can also be used to express uh, semantics um, if you use slightly different varieties of the, of the arrows that we have written here. Um, there's also phrase structure. So phrase structure is kind of the, the phrases that appear in the sentence, and it looks a little bit like this. So we have uh, a girl as a noun phrase, with a telescope as a preposition phrase, and they all are um, basically child phrases of this verb phrase corresponding to saw. So these are kind of two different ways of uh, expressing syntax, um, because this one down here is span-based, and this one is relation-based. Uh, we use slightly different parsing algorithms for both of them. I'm going to talk about dependency parsing, just because it's more widely used um, uh, now. But um, uh, yeah. So another variety of parsing that we're going to talk about is semantic parsing. And this is a Feng Shui's spe specialty, so he's going to be talking about it. Um, there's a couple uh, varieties of um, uh, semantic parsing that you could be doing. Um, specifically, what we show here is um, translating natural language intents to executable programs, specifically in the form of Python. So you write what you want to do in English, and it will translate it into Python for you. And um, after Feng Cheng is done uh, talking, you will not be worried at all that you have job security as a programmer. So don't worry about this. Um, OK. So um, parsing, uh, specifically syntactic parsing, is predicting linguistic structure from an input sentence. Um, and there's methods, uh, transition-based methods or incremental methods, um, which uh, step through actions one by one until we have an output. Um, this is a little bit like a history-based model for POS tagging that we talked about last time. So in other words, it's a model that takes in all the previous predictions that you've made and makes the next prediction. It could also be a little bit like a sequence-sequence model if you wanted to think of it that way. There's also graph-based models or dynamic programming-based models. Um, that calculate the probability of each edge or constituent and then perform some sort of dynamic programming to give you a tree over all of these edge predictions. And these are a little bit more like the linear CRF models that we talked about before. Um, there's a bit of complexity in this, so I'm just going to talk about the first uh, transition-based method uh, today. So a, f a famous uh, method for um, for dependency parsing uh, in the tr transition-based paradigm is called shift-reduce dependency parsing. Um, but So why would we want dependencies in the first place may be the first question that you'd like to ask. So um, dependencies are a form of syntax, um, but they also kind of give you a, a loose view of uh, semantics of a sentence. Um, so like for one example, uh, we have these labeled dependencies here. And these labeled dependencies uh, say, I have saw. And then the subject of saw is I. The object of saw is girl. And the, um, we have a prepositional phrase with here. So like, let's say you have a big corpus of data. And you kind of want to know, um, you want to answer a question, um, who or what kind of things tend to see, or what kind of things do you tend to do with a telescope? That would be an example of a question you might want to ask. So if you do that, what you do is you take this with a telescope um, prepositional phrase, and you find the verbs that correspond to it. And you might get C, or you might get um, uh, whatever else. Um, and you know, other things are like, what, um, what did Microsoft buy 
you know, what, what would be examples of things that Microsoft bought. So you could take Microsoft, uh, you could take by, uh, follow the n sums relation, and then look for the direct object of that. So basically it gives you a way to, um, it gives you a general purpose way to analyze syntax that nonetheless allows you to answer some, uh, some questions like this. And actually before I go on to this, um, I'll, I'll show you a kind of uh, neat thing. Um, which is, uh, this, uh, key grep. Which is like grep for trees. Um, so you could then take in these trees. Uh, this is a big tutorial. But like, let's say you have a tree like this. In this case, it's a phrase structure tree. It could also be a dependency, uh, dependency tree. And you can kind of like grep over these to find, to answer these linguistic questions um, that you would be interested in. And this is something that linguists uh, actually do when they're examining code. So, um, so this is, just gives you a, a reason why you might want to be doing this. Um, you know, a few years ago, I would have also said this is a really good thing to use in building systems. Uh, you know, like you could use it to extract features for your text classifier or something like that. Honestly, it's a little bit less clear now uh, whether tree structures give you really convincing uh, gains in some things. I'm going to give one example later where they do, in, in fact, give you good gains. Um, but, it, you know, I, I think the more interesting um, application of this is when you want to actually go in and physically, uh, manually examine your data. Okay, so um, then what do I mean by shift reduce parsing or incremental parsing? Um, so basically uh, what these kind of models do is they process words one by one left to right and they have a couple actions that you can take. And by taking these actions you build up a tree uh, of the tree structure representing the sentence. Um, they're based on two data structures. One is a queue of unprocessed words. One is a stack of partially processed words. And at each point, you choose one of the actions, uh, shift, which moves one word from the queue to the stack, reduce left, which takes the top word on the stack and uh, marks it as the head of the second word on the stack, and reduce right, which takes the second word on the stack and it, uh, marks it as the head of the, uh, of the top word on the stack. And basically, so this is a, a three class classification problem. You just need to pick any of these three things. And if you pick them correctly, you will get the correct output. So this is all very um, abstract, so I'd like to give a very quick example. Um, we have, I saw a girl, sorry, I, I call it stacking queue, but it's also called stacking buffer, so there's some internal inconsistency between my slides. But we have our stack and our buffer, and these are the kind of unprocessed words, and then the stack is the root, which indicates that the thing directly under the root is kind of the main uh, verb, of this, uh, main word of the sentence, usually a verb. So we first do shift, we move uh, from the buffer to the stack, so now we have two things on the stack. We then do shift again, and we have um, I saw, root I saw on the stack. Um, that's strange. I'm, <laughs> I have an off by one error in my action sequence. <laughs> so, um, so this should be reduced left. So basically what you're doing is you're, you're taking the, um, the top element of the stack and the second top element of the stack, and you're marking the second top element of the stack as your, um, as you, uh, or the top element of the stack is the head of the second top element of the stack. You then shift again, so this should be shift, and you get a new element on the stack. You then shift again, you get another element on the stack, and now we've run out of buffers, so we can't shift anymore, and we have to use all of the remaining actions as uh, right or left. So we do, um, we do reduce left, uh, which again marks ahead. This time we do a reduce right, so now we, uh, we draw an arrow from left to right, and finally we do uh, reduce, uh, reduce right. So uh, now we have a full tree, which says saw is the head of the tree, I and girl are children of uh, saw, and A is children of girl. So basically by doing this, we can, uh, we can get an output that looks uh, a little bit, uh, that looks exactly like the dependency tree we really want. So the, um, 
as I said, this is a classification problem. So we're given a, something called the configuration, which is basically the current status of the stack in the buffer. Um, and we take this in, and we want to take an action, uh, shift, left, or right. And so this is a three-class classification problem. And what we need to do is we need to take in this and make the, predict, uh, the correct prediction, right? So this is, um, this is simple, other than the fact that we need to take in this very complicated looking you know, data structure and use whatever information that we have uh, to try to, uh, to make the appropriate prediction here. So how do we do this? Um, we extract features from the configuration, uh, like what words are on the stack and the buffer, um, maybe something like what are their part of speech tags, uh, what are their children, um, and feature combinations here are important uh, because, like, for example, if we know the second word on the stack is a verb and the first word is a noun, um, then we're pretty sh uh, it's very likely the right action will be correct because it's very common that nouns are children's, children of verbs, for example. Um, and it used to be that um, you would have to create combination features manually. Um, this uh, Zhang and Divra paper is completely about making new feature combinations. That's what the entire paper is about, but it raised the state of the art on this task by two points or something. So they just designed uh, better features for this task. But um, now we have neural networks. So, uh, you know, I'm sorry, Zhang and Divra, but uh, you're out of the job. So the, the simplest way to do this is um, to take the stack and the uh, buffer and do some sort of feature extraction over the stack and the buffer, um, concatenate all of these features into uh, one big vector. So for example, this could be like words, um, part of speech tags, arc labels uh, of some variety here, and just feed them through a neural network. So what this is doing is it's saying, um, I'm not gonna try to extract combination features I'm going to extract, um, I'm going to let the neural network extract combination features. Um, so what exactly did they extract? They took the top three words on the stack and the buffer. So they had S1, S2, S3, B1, B2, B3. Um, if you had a tree on the stack, you would only take the word that's at the top of the tree. So this would only take has, it wouldn't take he immediately. Then in addition to this, you would take the two leftmost and rightmost children of the top two words on the stack. So you would take, uh, you know, uh, you would have these feature templates uh, where you would take the top word and the second to top word and take their left child, left two children and right two children. Um, and then you would take the leftmost and rightmost grandchildren. So you go two steps down. Um, and the part of speech tag of all of the above and arc labels for all children and grandchildren. So you would just take all of these, you would stack the embeddings of all of these things together, and you would feed them through a feed-forward network and make the decision. Um, so this seems like it might kind of work. You know, it, beat this, it more or less beat the state of the art. I think it was about the same as the state of the art, but it was way, way faster, because uh, actually extracting all of these features was relatively expensive using a hash table or something like this. Um, but what's the problem with this? Any ideas? Yeah. Um, uh, as an analogy to something like a difference between RNN and CII, mm -hmm. or do you use this like locally optimal? Right, this uses locally optimal choices. That is a problem, but that's not the problem I was thinking about. <laughs> but good, uh, good point. This only makes locally optimal choices. Um, any other questions? Any other ideas? My, my other, uh, so what I was looking for is, I said we don't want to do feature extraction, but I still have a full slide on how we extract features, right? So that's kind of, you know, uh, kind of defeats the purpose of having a neural net that should be able to extract all our features for us. So um, let's try to do something more, uh, more sophisticated. And in order to do this, um, we, We'll first uh, talk about how to represent uh, tree structures in neural networks. And this is useful um, if, even if you want to um, just use tree structures that you already have from some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of upstream model or some sort of upstream annotations in a tree structured uh, classifier or something like this. 
Um, but it's also useful in parsing. And I'll cover the kind of like classifier idea first and then the, the parsing idea second. So why tree structure? Um, this is one example of a tree structure from the Stanford uh, Sentiment Tree Bank. Um, so the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank is actually the example data I use in the code for this class, um, where people are talking about how horrible movies from Steven Seagal are and uh, you know, various things like that. Um, but in the example text classification uh, data sets that I used, um, the, uh, I only provided the top label and all of the um, all of the words here, right? Um, but in fact, um, there, if you look at kind of a tree structure of this uh, of this output, you can see that even in a positive sentence, um, there are negative like parts of it, right? And so you have in depth, um, lax in depth. That's kind of a negative thing, right? Um, empire lacks in, in depth. That's kind of a negative thing. Um, but then you have uh, its heart. So heart is kind of positive, um, etc. And then you see it's like it makes for, up for it with its heart. So it's taking you know a negative statement, but then it's saying, but you know uh, this is uh, overall it's better. So. Um, there's kind of a very concise definition of um, you know how this sentiment might change based on you know certain uh, statements or something like that, and it's very closely linked to the hierarchical structure of language that we have here. So that's at least the motivation for um, this kind of tree structured model. Um, you might uh, also think of this not like, for example. You know, on a sentence, maybe Bert can figure this out for you. Uh, you know, maybe maybe we don't need a tree. Maybe Bert can figure this out for you. But then let's think about uh, moving on to multi-document or like a, a long document or something like this, uh, where you need discourse coherence, etc. Um, and there, it becomes a lot more sketchy. It becomes a lot less uh, more questionable whether just a large pre-trained model could could figure that out. And in fact. One of the things that big neural language models are particularly bad at is maintaining a coherent discourse over really uh, long sequences. So um, I think there's an argument that having some concept of the structure in language is still useful in building models. Um, so uh, recursive neural networks are a really simple way to do this. Basically, the idea is um, you have an RNN. Uh, but the RNN, instead of being uh, defined over sequences, it's defined over trees. So we have a tree like this, I hate this movie. The syntax tree happens to be um, like kind of uh, right branching like this. So this tree is a phrase, hate, uh, sorry, this movie is a phrase, hate this movie is a phrase, I hate this movie is a phrase. So basically what you do is you do um, composition of the lower order, um, like the smaller constituents, up to the larger constituents. So, um, uh, what does this tree RNN look look like? It's basically like an RNN, um, or pretty similar to an RNN, but it's basically like um, you have a parent, uh, you have a parent vector, and you have a child vector. Or actually, let me make sure I don't. Oh yeah, I do. Okay, so you have a um, you have a parent vector um, up here, so that's the result of this tree RNN function, and you have child vector number one, child vector number two. You multiply it by a weight matrix, add a bias, and take a nonlinearity. So it's as simple as that. The only thing is that um, when you're calculating the value for this phrase, you don't take in words, but you rather take in um, this higher uh, like higher level phrase representation. Um, in this paper by Socher et al., they basically uh, additionally parameterize this by the constituent type. So saying if this is a noun phrase, I'm going to do it in a particular way. If this is a verb phrase, I'm going to do it in a different way. So they just have a different variety of parameters for each of these uh, phrases. Another way is, um, you know, 
2011 was the year of RNNs, 2015 was the year of LSTMs. So they basically took uh, you know, this tree structured RNN um, and they, uh, they turned it into an LSTM where it additionally had basically connections um, uh, that added in the uh, values for the previous vectors. Um, and the way they did this was um, they, they proposed two methods. One was a child sum a tree LSTM, where basically the forget gate value is different for each child. Um, so the network can learn to like ignore children or ignore particular um, uh, like nodes in their child uh, representation uh, one by one. So to give an example of why you might want to do that, um, uh, let, let's say we have this movie. Um, it could also be I hate that movie. And it doesn't really matter which one it is. It's more important that it's a movie. So you would forget most of the like cell state for this and remember most of the cell state for this. So you would just adjust the, the forget gate to do that appropriately. Um, and then hate is really important in sentiment analysis. So maybe you would forget movie and just remember the word hate uh, at the next one. Um, there's also an NARI tree LSTM where you just have different uh, parameters for each child. Um, there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. You can also do it with a bidirectional LSTM. You can also do it with attention. Um, but basically the idea is you want to take in um, some set of vectors corresponding to the children and, um, and turn them into a single vector here. So any sort of combination function uh, will do. Yeah. So wouldn't you benefit that is brought on by having such a tree structure and not just having multiple layers of the bio LSTM? So um, what is the advantage of having a tree structure? Well, so number one, there's no controversy that there is hierarchical structure in language, right? You know, um, uh, like there's structure in language uh, where certain phrases play certain roles. Um, if you negate a phrase, no matter how long that, that phrase is, you're basically negating the information in all of it, not just, you know, the two neighboring words or something like that. So I think theoretically, if you came up with a tree structure that mapped the hierarchy in language, um, it would certainly give you an easier way to generalize. Um, and I'm going to show a specific example of that for language modeling in like a few slides. Um, that being said, um, as I mentioned before, uh, neural networks are universal function approximators, so you wouldn't necessarily need to do this in order to get good accuracy. Um, I don't think anybody has actually tried pre-training a model with this sort of hierarchical structure on the same level that you pre-trained BERT. And it's quite possible that a model with this structure, if you trained it in the same data regime, you know, uh, or something like this, would actually work better than a transformer, especially on edge cases or something like that. So um, uh, basically, it's a better inductive bias that matches our intuitions about language. Um, the reason why I said I can't recommend it like really strongly right now is because you know it seems that something like BERT gets a lot of that already, um, uh, but not all of it. So uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so what is the inspiration behind creating traces from right to left in this uh, model? Oh, so this uh, this just happens to be an example where the phrase is created from right to left, and actually in um, in English. Right branching structure is really common because English is a head initial language. Um, but uh, to, give, to give a non right to left example, it would be uh, this um, cat ate a hamburger. And then the tree would look something like this. So it wouldn't be fully right branching uh, because this is a noun phrase here. Uh, this is another noun phrase, so um, it wouldn't it wouldn't be this. I, I realized that later that I probably should have had a non a non right branching example. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, for this structure, are we also using um, multiple different tree structures to handle different phrases, like noun phrase, verse phrase? Um, so the way they did it in this paper is they appended a tag at the beginning and end indicating um, what kind of phrase it was. So they uh, appended a noun phrase and then ran it through a biostium. And because it's a biostium, it can learn what to do with it there. Yeah. Good question.
Okay. Um, so we have an example of this in the code repository if you want to take a look uh, at what it looks like. Um, one caveat about these things is they're a little bit hard to implement efficiently. So um, uh, you, uh, th this is a simple example, but you might have to think about it a little carefully if you wanted to implement it uh, efficiently. Um, so anyway, I'd like to go back to parsing very quickly. So this is dependency parsing with less engineering and wider context. And basically the idea is we don't want to do the feature engineering that I just talked about in the previous example. Um, so how can we encode all of the information about the parse uh, configuration within RNN? And so we have information about stack and buffer and past actions. And what we do is we have three LSTMs, one LSTM encoding the entire stack, one LSTM encoding the entire buffer, and one LSTM encoding all of our previous actions. Um, so we know how to encode the buffer. These are just words, right? So we, we know how to run an LSTM over words. We're doing it backwards. So we're doing it, you know, from, uh, it's a backwards LSTM because these are the words that are in the future, but um, still we know how to do this. Encoding actions, this is also simple. We just have an embedding for each action. The difficulty is now how do we encode the stack? Um, and the reason why it's difficult is now we have trees, right? We don't just have, uh, we don't just have words. However, I just told you a way to encode trees, right? We, uh, we take the tree, um, we do some sort of combination function um, based on the fact that this is an AMOD um, and maybe the, the head word here, and we combine them together with a by LSTM or a tree LSTM or something like this. So really, it's actually the simple. Uh, we do a tree structure and composition until we get a vector for the tree, and then we run these composed vectors through the LSTM. So, yeah. Um, and anyway, I skipped over a little bit of content in order to give uh, Peng Chung a bit of time. There's also kind of language modeling versions of this uh, that have a language model that looks very similar to this. Um, uh, basically, every time you have a new phrase, it does tree structure and composition to get information about uh, the phrase included in, um, in each of the vectors in the LSTM. And there's an interesting um, paper uh, by Kunkoro et al. 2018 that is uh, like a ray of hope for anybody who believes uh, linguistic structure is still uh, you know, necessary in, uh, in models. And basically, the idea is um, they took a, a strong uh, LSTM-based model, um, and they, uh, they took a strong LSTM-based model. They also took a, a model where they basically um, tried to generate trees, um, but they tried to generate them without any of the tricky tree structured composition here. They just turned it into a, a sequence of uh, symbols corresponding to the symbols in the tree. Um, and then they had this tricky tree structured composition uh, type, uh, type thing based on uh, the linguistic ideas that these phrases are compositional, um, uh, combining together the different words uh, in a coherent way. And um, the overall accuracy between these was remarkably similar. So the overall, if you just measure the perplexity over every single word, um, it's remarkably similar. However, um, we have an example like this, where it's parts of the river valley have or has. And what is the answer here? If, it, if the verb, uh, sorry, if the, the noun that was a subject of have or has was valley, then it would be has. If it was river, it would also be has. But because in this case, um, this whole noun phrase, the head of the noun phrase is parts, um, the correct answer is have. So basically they, they added some distractors in the middle like this, and they measured the, uh, essentially the accuracy of deciding uh, between these. And you can see that um, the error rate of this RNNG, which is kind of the fancy model that considers uh, syntax in an important, in a good way, when the, um, when the number of uh, uh, distractors or attractors is zero, um, it's essentially the same. Uh, the, the error rate is essentially the same between them. Maybe the, uh, the fancy model is a little bit worse. But as you add more distractors, 
um, and you actually have to look farther back in the sentence to get the actual noun, um, you can see that this uh, kind of fancy model that has an idea of the syntax of the sentence is doing far better uh, at disambiguating these uh, things here. So um, why can't a regular LSTM solve this task? And the answer is, this is kind of a unusual test case, right? This is a, a test case that very rarely occurs in uh, naturally occurring sentences. Nonetheless, if you want to create a grammar corrector, it's, uh, you, you would like to get this right most of the time, right? You don't want to be fixing people's has and to have uh, just because they put a few extra nouns in between. So, um, so basically, uh, what this is showing is this is making the model a lot more robust um, to kind of things that aren't well rep represented in the training data. And I think that's the real uh, function of these sort of inductive biases or using a tree structure here. It's to make the model actually work when you don't have a big model that has covered all of the cases that you've seen. Or when your big model has not covered all of the cases that you will want to be robust to in your, uh, in your test set. So I think that is all for me. Um, I, I'll take questions on this part, but I'll turn it over to Peng Chung. Uh, You can use my computer. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I'm Pang Cheng, I'm a PhD student uh, at LTI, working with Grant on neurosimilar parsing. So today I'm going to introduce you to the research area of neurosimilar parsing and how this research area relates to today's topic, like generating trees or graphs. So actually, uh, smell parsers are important recipes to build a uh, to build natural language interfaces to modern AI systems. Actually, in recent years, we have witnessed a great advance in this line of research. And uh, I think the most exciting thing is that uh, smart parsing is actually making a real world impact to people's everyday life. For example, um, we must have all used those virtual commercial virtual assistants. So those virtual assistants can help us accomplish some simple tasks like setting alarm or remind us to attend a meeting or attend to today's class, things like that. So in the near future, we hope that programmers can also benefit from this kind of techniques. So when a programmer like a novice programmer, when he or she is learning a new programming language, he can just specify his intent in natural language. Then we can automatically generate uh, the code uh, for him using smart parsing techniques. So to put it more formally, Semantic parsing considers the research of translating a user-issued natural language question or utterance into some machine executable meaning representation. So basically, those kind of meaning representation, meaning representations are just machine executable programmers. I will give you more details about this later. So why uh, does semantic parsing has anything to do with today's topic, like generating? Uh, trees or graphs using neural models. It turns out to be that uh, for those mini representations that the puzzle is going to generate, uh, those mini representations usually has strong underlying structures, usually tree structures, or sometimes they have uh, graphical structures. For example, here we have a database query generated from a user's query like show me flights from Pittsburgh to Seattle. You might issue this query to Google Flight. And we represent the database query using a domain-specific programming language called Lambda Calculus Logical Form. And it's basically pretty much a Lisp-style uh, S uh, expression. So you can imagine that we can parse this S expression to a uh, tree structure uh, in pre-order. For example, those uh, function names, flight, uh, the departure city and destinations, these are uh, non-terminal nodes on the tree, while those uh, arguments like the actual cities and the time of the flight can be uh, the terminals on the tree. 
So, so basically, this is how we represent uh, many representations using tree structures. And today, I'm going to tell you how can we build neural models to pass natural language to those tree structures, many representations. So depending on the actual task we are going to uh, look at, so those many representations can take a variety of forms. For example, in the left-hand side, we have a toyish example of flight booking, and uh, the target mini representation is going to be a program, basically a database query, and it can be defined using some domain-specific program language, like SQL query or a Lambda logical form <coughs> I show here. We can also imagine to use semantic parsers to generate programs in much more complex grammars. For example, in the code generation scenario, we will, we'd like to translate a programmer's natural language intent, like sort a list in descending order, into programs written in modern program languages, like Python or C Sharp. So those are the different mini rotations that can be generated from neural semantic parsers. So before I, go in, uh, before I go to details about how we can generate those programs from a natural language query using neural models, I'd like to make a clarification about mini implementations. Actually, semantic parsing has lots of different research, uh, sub-research areas. So today we are going to focus on generating those machine executable programs uh, from uh, natural language. Actually, there are also another stream of research which considers uh, generating a structured linguistic annotations that can capture the semantics of the natural language sentence. For example, in the right-hand side, I show you how we can represent uh, the natural language the boy wants to go using a graphical, uh, strongly typed uh, structure. And this, this is called after mini rotation, but we are not going to cover this in today's class. We are more interested in generating those uh, machine executable programs from natural language queries that hopefully can be used in developing modern conversational AI systems. Okay, let's first look at the general workflow of a semantic parser. So basically, the user will uh, give the parser a query like this one. And so basically, the semantic parser will translate the query into a machine executable uh, program. You can imagine we can execute this program against some uh, knowledge bases, for example, a database of flight information. And the execution result basically from the knowledge base will be a, a list of flight information that can take us to, from Pittsburgh to Seattle, things like that. So this is the general workflow of semantic parser. So it, it is actually one of the applications of using neural semantic parser to build uh, conversational AI agents. So in the previous slides, I show you one concrete example, like how we can use semantic parsing for flight booking from natural language. So actually, there are lots of different applications of this line of research. So I'm going to briefly introduce uh, some of the representative data sets commonly available for academic research to give you some uh, better idea of uh, the tasks we are going to tackle. So I believe that for uh, those companies might have uh, their own proprietary uh, data sets to train either Apple Siri or Amazon Alexa. But today I'm going to uh, show you those freely available data sets that you might uh, use in your uh, course project. So we are basically looking at two kinds of data sets. One is those uh, classical semantic processing benchmark, where we ground the natural language into a domain-specific uh, program, like SQL query or this Lambda calculus logic form. Then I will uh, discuss some uh, interesting data sets about generating, uh, modern, uh, generating programs in modern program languages, like Python from natural language. So those programmers are much more complex than uh, some simpler SQL queries. Okay, let's first look at the uh, first uh, kinds of uh, data sets. So I think the three most commonly used data sets are those three, the so jQuery, ETIRS, and the jobs. So you can basically view each of them as a task domain specific question answering data set, where the target is to uh, generate a database query defined in a specific uh, logical formalism according to the task. So GeoQuery is about a few hundreds of collections of questions about the geographical information of the United States. And eight years is about a few thousand of examples about flight booking. And the jobs is a very small uh, set of natural language queries and annotated programs about querying a job database. So those are the three most commonly used uh, data sets to benchmark a semantic parser. 
So I think a recent task that has gained increasingly uh, popularity is the text to SQL task. I saw, I saw some of you guys might be interested in this line. So uh, in this uh, task, the input to a system is both the natural language query from the user as well as a database. For example, a database of flight booking or database of uh, restaurant or hotel room booking, things like that. And it's the parser's job to both understand the natural language uh, query from the user as well as how the structured information is represented in the database schema. For example, in a flight booking scenario, we might have two DB tables, one about flights, one about airports, and there might be some interconnected relation defined by primary and forward key. So the target SQL query generated by SMAP parser can have a rather complex form. For example, the parser needs to join different uh, columns in different tables to generate the query on the right-hand side. And a representative uh, benchmark set for text to SQL query generation is called Spider. I think the nice thing about this data set is that it uh, has like 200 databases. And for each database, it is associated with roughly uh, 50 natural language queries paired with annotated SQL queries. So the parser really need to learn how to generalize across different domains because these data sets, these databases uh, are about uh, information of different domains like flight booking, hotel booking, things like that. And the testing databases are actually hidden from the training set. So the parser, it really requires the parser to learn a generalized rule to generalize across different domains to understand the natural language query as well as the structure information uh, for DBs in different domains. So for the next category of data sets is basically about how can we parse a natural language into a machine executable program defined in modern program language like Python. So for this part, I would like to introduce uh, uh, the data sets we built called Kanala. It's a collection of a few thousands of uh, natural language questions that programmers come up with, especially novice programmers, when they are learning a new language like Python. So as you can see, those kinds of questions are highly compositional. And the target uh, code we'd like to generate is a, a Python code snippet. So this can be rather complex. Actually, this data set is very challenging. Even for the best performing system, it only registers less than 10% uh, exact match accuracy. So if you, you are interested in uh, smart parsing, I also recommend you to work on this data set to push forward uh, the results. OK, we have talked about a lot of stuff about uh, common benchmark sets in this area. So let's look at how can we build smart parsers that can translate a user's natural language query into a machine executable program. So, uh, so I'd like to first introduce a very commonly used learning paradigm, basically like any other classical NLP tasks. We like to perform supervised learning of smart parsers. Basically, in the corpora given to us, we have annotated natural language queries with annotated uh, programs. So in this surprise learning setting of smart parsers, so you can imagine the simplest way to develop a smart parser quickly is to reduce the parsing problem into a sequence to sequence learning problem, right? We have the input natural language query and the sequence tokens, and we can linearize the tree structure program as a uh, sequence of tokens as well, right? So we can just uh, use a classical neural sequence sequence model with attention for this. But you can imagine this is not the optimal solution because as Graham has discussed, so these programs have very strong structures. If you just uh, linearize the program as a sequence tokens and generate the program using a sequence to sequence uh, model, sometimes the generated program might not be uh, syntactically valid. For example, it might not be a tree, things like that. So I think uh, those are the issues of uh, predicting programs using a, in a linearized fashion using sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. So the issue here is that those vanilla sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, they ignore the rich structures in the programs. So I think the core research question in semantic parsing, one of the core research questions is how shall we 
and additional inductive biases to the network to better capture the structure of the program. So by adding inductive biases, I mean that we need to develop our neural decoding model to reflect, to kind of reflect the tree structures of the programs. So you can imagine one uh, method for achieving this goal to adding more better inductive bias to capture the structural program is that we develop with the neural decoding model, which is going to use to, to predict program to strictly follow the grammar property, grammatical property of the program. So here I show you an example of the text to SQL task because we know for a valid SQL query is basically it basically consists of different parts, like we have a select clause, we have a from clause, we have joining, we need to join multiple tables, and we need we might have multiple uh, conditions specified in the where clause. You can imagine we can use different neural models, each, uh, one for each, one for predicting each of the, these four components in an SQL query. So in this way, your model can have better inductive bias. Hopefully, you can guarantee that for any output from the model, it should be a valid SQL query consisting of these four parts, right? But you can see that this might not be optimal because you cannot scale from this specific domain of generating SQL queries to other domain, let's say generating uh, Python queries, Python programs, for example. So what we are really looking for is a general purpose structure of neural networks that can capture the tree structures of programs, right? So the first, uh, paper I'm going to discuss is called Structure Aware Decoding for Smart Parsing. So instead of uh, having a linearized decoder to predict the tokens in the program one by one, you can imagine we have a tree structure decoder. For example, here we have a, a program defined as a tree. You can imagine we can run the recurrent decoder to predict the first layer of the tree. For example, here we have a uh, here in the second layer, we have four tokens, the, uh, the dollar sign zero, E, and a non-terminal end. We can first use a neural network to predict, uh, use a recurrent network decoder to predict these three uh, nodes. Then we move on to the second layer, because here the uh, end layer is a, sorry, the end node is a non-terminal. So we then run a second layer of recurrent neural decoder to predict uh, the child nodes for this end node. Then we move on to predict the next layer, so on and so forth. So basically, we have a hierarchy of recurrent decoders to predict the nodes in the program layer by layer. So that's one way to capture the tree structures in the target program. Okay, so as you can see, this kind of method can uh, naturally capture the tree structures in programs, but probably we can still have some room for improvement. Uh, for example, uh, we can imagine that for a developer, when he or she wants to write program, a database query for this particular question, uh, for example, for me, I probably will first define the overall structure of the program, for example, uh, I find in this natural language query, it mentions two constraints. One is the departure city should be Dallas. Another one is the time should be after 4 p.m. Probably I will first specify uh, two constraints. And after I specify the two constraints, I will then fill in the actual values in the two constraints. One should be the departure city being Dallas. Another one should uh, is the uh, uh, time being after 4 p.m. So as you can see, I think for human Developers, when we think of uh, problems, when we try, when we generate, when we sorry, when we translate uh, questions into programs, we will first have a holistic view about the question. So we first want to generate a overall structure. Then we then fill in the actual values uh, in the structure. So there might be some notion of sketch going on here. So another probably more natural way of generating programs will be using the notion of sketch. The idea is that you first generate, let's say, all the non-terminal nodes here in, on the tree. And once you have the, all the non-terminals here, basically those non-terminals defined as a sketch can tell you the overall structure of the program. Then given the overall structure of the program, you can fill in the actual values on the tree, for example, uh, all the terminal nodes. 
So this is also called sketch guided or course to fine decoding. I think there should be two advantages of using this, having this notion of sketches. The first one is generating a overall sketch should be much easier than generating the fully specified program. And the second advantage will be that once you have the overall sketch, the model can condition on the sketch to fill in the actual values, uh, which are non-terminal nodes on the tree. So the model hopefully can be more confident in terms of predicting those uh, actual values uh, in those terminal nodes. So this, should, uh, so this should be the two advantages of using this cost to find uh, decoding arrangement to generate any tree structures. I think you can generalize this idea not only for uh, generating programs, but also for generating other tree structures for the task. <clears throat> okay, so so far we have discussed two methods of structure aware uh, parsing. So basically these two methods utilize the structure information in the program. So I think another way to improve uh, upon these methods will be that not only uh, does a program have strong structure, the structure actually follow a predefined grammar. For example, if we look at any valid Python code snippet, we can represent the Python code snippet as a, using a tree structure called abstract syntax tree, <coughs> like the one uh, on the right hand side. And what's more, so basically for any valid Python code snippet, uh, the, its syntax tree should follow a, the Python's abstract grammar, so defined on the left hand side. So actually in Python, we have around 200 production rules in the grammar. And uh, for a val any valid Python source code, it should follow this grammar. And we can basically generate a syntax tree by applying the rules in the grammar in a top-down and left-to-right manner. <coughs> so in order to generate not only tree-structured outputs, but also uh, grammatically correct uh, programs, we need to somehow utilize those grammar information predefined for a given program like Python or C Sharp or C++. So the idea will be we use the grammar of the program and prior knowledge to guide the neural sequence to sequence learning. So in this case, hopefully, um, for any prediction of programs uh, given by the neural sequence to sequence model, it should uh, be a correct program following the grammar of the target program language. So here's the idea. So give me a natural language intent. We first use a neural sequence to sequence model using the grammar and the prior knowledge to generate the syntax tree of the program. And once we have the syntax tree of the program, we can then deterministically convert the program, the syntax tree into the surface, uh, uh, surface tokens, uh, for example, in Python. <coughs> So since we want to generate a tree structured syntax tree using a sequential neural sequence to sequence model, so we first define we need to first define a generic story for any given syntax tree. So basically we can imagine we can use two kinds of actions to incrementally build up a tree. So the first type of action will be applying a production rule from the grammar to the current hypothesis. And we can use those kind of apply rule actions to incrementally grow the um, derivation tree by adding more production rules from the grammar. And once we reach a terminal node, for example, a terminal node de denoting a string literal or function name, we can use another type of action called generate token action to actually populate a empty terminal node with the actual value, for example, function names or string literals. So let's look at a concrete example. So imagine we are going to generate the syntax tree for this very simple Python code snippet. So we start from a pretty much empty derivation with only a root node, and we use a uh, apply rule action to apply the production rule that root node should lead to a expression node. Here, expression node denotes uh, the program to be generated is a function called expression. <coughs> then we continue. Uh, by firing up a bunch of uh, apply rule actions to expand the opening node on the derivation. And here we have like a call node basically denotes a function call. And here the call node actually has three children. 
the leftmost one should be the function name, and the second two are about the actual arguments for the sorted function. So we continue generation of the tree. And once we reach a terminal node, for example, here this green node will denote the name of the function, which is sorted. We then use another kind of action, the generate token action, to populate this empty terminal node with the actual values. And we can continue this generation process, and we can finish our work once there's all the nodes are filled in on the derivation tree. And you can imagine on the right-hand side, we have a nice action sequence, which can generate the left-hand side tree. So you can imagine we can use a, a neural sequence-to-sequence -sequence model to predict such action sequence. So this is how you can leverage the grammar of the program language and the prior knowledge to help you guide the generation process of programs in a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. So we actually implemented an open source, sorry, open source um, framework for this idea. It's called Tranks, and it supports multiple languages, both for Python and SQL query. So you can use it for your course project. So basically, uh, you can define the grammar um, of the program you are going to generate in a textual format like this one. And uh, the model basically will translate the grammar into using a transition system and incrementally build a tree by applying the grammar rules provided by you. <clears throat> OK, so uh, before moving on to details about the second uh, section about uh, neural semantic processing, I'd like to make a side note about the importance of modern copying in semantic processing. So as you can see, for those programs we are going to generate, they are referring to the user-issued utterance a lot of times, right? So for example, in here, I, one day I tried to set alarm uh, using Siri to help me uh, wake up early to catch an early morning flight. And the Siri is too kind to uh, decide to <laughs> postpone the alarm three hours later. So you can imagine it's very important is to have this copy mechanism to copy the exact entity mentioned by the user's queries. So hopefully, in the near future, when you join Siri, you can fix this bug. Okay. <clears throat> okay, to summarize a bit, so we have talked about supervised learning of smart parsers. So basically, we assume having access to parallel couple of natural language questions, as well as annotated programs. We can train whatever uh, text to tree uh, models we like to train using this annotated couple. And we discussed two instantiations under this line. One is this structured aware decoding, where we uh, generate a tree structure program using a hierarchy of uh, uh, recurrent neural network decoders. And we also talked about the idea of using the predefined grammar of the program to constrain the search space of valid programs. OK, now let's discuss some issues about this line of research. I think the important issue here is how shall we collect such kind of questions annotated with programs in large scale and in a cost-effective fashion. So it turns out that on the one hand, those modern neural models with millions of parameters, they are very data hungry. They require large amounts of such annotated parallel data to train. But on the other hand, collecting such parallel data in large amount is very uh, costly. For example, in our research, we collected uh, less than 3,000 examples of natural language questions issued by programmers paired with annotated Python code snippets. It roughly cost us uh, 2,000 US dollars to collect less than 3,000 examples. So you can see data collection is costly, mostly because we need to hire domain experts for annotation efforts, but domain experts are very expensive to pay. So how can we mitigate this issue, this costly data annotation efforts? So another kind of learning paradigm is instead of directly training the model using annotated programs, we can instead train the model using some weaker supervision signal. For example, imagine we have the access to the execution results of the programs. Hopefully, we can use these execution results as indirect supervision to learn the model. 
So you can pretty much imagine this as in a reinforcement learning setting, where the parser acts as the reinforce agent. So given a user's issued query, the agent will come up with different hypothesized programs. And some programs will execute to the correct results, some are not. Then the agent will be rewarded according, accordingly, depending on uh, whether the program can lead to the correct execution result or not. So basically, uh, we can train a parser without annotated programs in a reinforcement learning setting, and we call this as weakly supervised learning. OK, so to put it more formally, uh, for weekly supervised learning of semantic parsers, so we don't have any access to the gold standard program for our user-issued natural language question. We instead have a executable environments that the, the agent can play with. For example, these database tables, and we have the correct answer for the question. So it's the agent's job to come up with different hypothesized programs. Hopefully, it can lead to the correct execution results, the answer here. So it's basically a reinforced learning problem and you can imagine it's pretty much a, roll, it's a game of rolling a dice. But here our dice doesn't have fixed size, but it, it has a combinatory, uh, combinatorial number of size with respect to the length of the programs. So it's actually a very difficult reinforcement learning problem. So most of the time, you can imagine the puzzle as the agent will just uh, come up with an incorrect program, which will lead to an incorrect answer. And hopefully, uh, after tens of thousands of uh, trials and errors, the puzzle can successfully hit the correct uh, program, and it will be rewarded accordingly. So you can imagine we have a binary reward of one, which means the puzzle can get the answer correct, and zero otherwise. But the problem is here that learning in such a setting is quite noisy, because not only does the correct program can lead to the correct answer, there are lots of spurious programs which can also lead to the correct execution results. For example, here in the third program, it's not about querying the uh, city in US with largest population, it's about querying the city in US with the largest GDP. But it happens to get the answer correct. So there's no way to distinguish on the reward level uh, the difference between the second correct program and the third spurious program. So as you can see, the puzzle need to learn in such a noisy reward with lots of such kind of spurious programs. So to summarize, for weekly supervised semantic parsing, there are lots of challenges, basically those three ones. The first one is the puzzle has to search in an exponentially large search space of discrete programs. And this search space is very large and with very sparse rewards the parser can only access to a binary reward of execution result being correct or not. And also there is a problem of spurious programs, where there are lots of programs which are not semantically correct, like the third one, but it happens to execute to the correct result. So how can we train a model in such a weekly supervised setting efficiently, hopefully can mitigate those issues? So I'd like to briefly mention some existing research, and the more, I think those research are very recent. And the first one is to tackle the, to make search more efficient, to improve the data efficiency of reinforced learning of semantic parsing. Uh, one idea will be we catch those high reward programs, basically programs that can lead to the correct execution result using a memory buffer. And during the sampling uh, procedure of the parser, the puzzle can pay more attention by revisiting the programs that already discovered to, having the, to have the correct execution results. So in this case, we are kind of biasing the sampling procedure towards revisiting the programs discovered so far by the puzzle that can have a higher reward. So this, so, uh, so this is one way to make search more efficient. So another problem as I mentioned earlier, is this spurious programs issue, right? We have two pro programs. Both can lead to the correct answer, but only the left one is cor semantically correct. The right one is a spurious program. So how can we distinguish the two using neural network? So it turns out that we can borrow some task-specific heuristics. You can imagine we have, if we have external similarity models that can measure the semantic similarity between a natural language phrase and a program token, we can try to compare the similarity between 
the pro natural language phrase populars with the program function population, and it's a phrase populars with the program uh, token GDP. So basically, intuitively, like the similarity between populars and population should be much higher than the similarity between populars and GDP. So in this case, you have some external signals that can help you to distinguish uh, between the semantically correct program and the spurious ones. You can also use a bank translation score to translate the generated program back to the natural language query and measure the back translation likelihood. So hopefully the translation probability of translating uh, the left-hand side program back to the query should be much higher than the back translation score for the right case. Okay, so those are some examples of how can we tackle these spurious programs issue and how can we make search more efficient in weekly supervised learning. Oops. Okay. To give you some conclusion, first, today we discussed the uh, neural semantic parsing. And to remind you a bit, so here is the general workflow of the neural semantic parser and how it can be uh, used for in conversational AI systems. And given user issued query, we use the parser to generate a machine executable program. And using the program, we can return some answers to the users. And we talked about two kinds of learning paradigms. One is the classical supervised learning, where we have access to annotated programs, which are meaning representations. And in another learning paradigm is the weekly supervised uh, learning of parsers where we only have the execution results and we use the execution results as weak signals to train the parser in reinforcement learning, right? And we also talk about, yes, yeah, these two learning paradigms, with or without access to the gold standard programs. And for the supervised semantic parsing, we discussed two uh, categories of parsers. One is this tree uh, structure-aware decoding, this tree-based decoding. Another way is how can we use grammar as prior knowledge to constrain the search space? And for the weekly supervised semantic parsing, we discussed the problem of efficient exploration as well as how can we tackle sparse larger forms. Okay, uh, I'd like to conclude uh, my part of the session by discussing some open challenges in this line of research. Hopefully this can inspire you to search for research ideas for your course project. So the first challenge for semantic parsing is that natural language is actually highly compositional. If we look at, at this real world example query, this query is from the Google query log, uh, publicly available is a subset of queries from uh, Google query log. And you can see, so imagine we want to answer this query using a structured knowledge base called FreeBase. So, but the puzzle need to interpret this uh, compositional natural language uh, uh, complement is a com should be a complement, right? Before he was a president, if you want to translate this very short natural language phrase before somebody was doing something, it turns out that the underlying SparkQL or GraphQL query is quite complex. For example, if the knowledge, uh, if the knowledge base is defined uh, on the left hand side, so in in order to retrieve the guy's occupation before he became president, you need to first find the last occupation, last profession of James K. Polk uh, by sorting all his previous profession history, right? You get the last occupation before he was a president and you retrieve the date and you then do a jump to get uh, to, uh, to jump to the node of James K. Polk's presidency and to get uh, Oh, sorry, you, you first navigate to the node that denoting James K. Polk was a president. Then you navigate to the previous node to retrieve his previous occupation. So as you can see, the underlying SparkQL query can be quite complex. So this is one example of why natural language semantic processing is very challenging, because natural language, even for very small and succinct natural language phrases, they can be quite compositional in a programmatic uh, view. <clears throat> The second challenge is how shall we scale from dealing with structured knowledge bases like the FreeBase example we saw in the previous slides to open domain knowledge. Because I think most of the world's knowledge is expressed in free form natural language text. So, so that's why we have a machine reading comprehension benchmark like Squad, where we like to develop a neural model that can 
directly digest the knowledge uh, in free from text. So how can we scale semantic parsing, semantic parser to process knowledge specified in free from text is also a very interesting challenge. If we want to summarize the above two challenges uh, in a figure, it will be like this. So there are two uh, dimensions. One is the depth of the knowledge we have. For example, for semantic parsing, we usually deal with very compositional queries, like show me flight from one city to another before uh, a particular date, right? This can be very compositional query, but we only we are only dealing with those composition query on very sm small domains like flight booking or restaurant booking. And we also have such kind of less composition queries that can be executed against large scale knowledge bases. Less, like the one we saw before. What does James K. Park do before he was a president, right? And for modern machine reading comprehension and web search, they are dealing with much shallower semantics of uh, compositionality, but on a much broader domain, right? You have the full access to Wikipedia uh, for your reading comprehension system, or Google can process all the web pages on the internet. But in a compositionality level, the queries you are issuing to Google can be much shallower uh, than a database query, right? So I think uh, the future research will line uh, on the upper right side, right? You have both a quite broader domain of knowledge sources that your system can access to. Also the queries that the system should process will be highly compositional. So that's just some takeaway message for you to think about and to hopefully this can inspire you for your uh, coursework. Okay, cool. Any questions? So going back to your weekly supervised uh, I'm curious, when do you have uh, such scenario uh, mm -hmm. in which you don't have the program available, mm -hmm. but you have the execution output? It seems that you, mm -hmm. it would, you would most often have the program too if you get the execution output. Yes, so that's a, when is this useful? That's yes, a, that's a very good question. Uh, one argument will be uh, collecting the questions with answers should be much easier than collecting questions with paired SQL queries. So you can imagine you can um, give a limited budget. You can collect much more such kind of weak examples compared with uh, paying a programmer to annotate SQL queries for your questions. So that will be one motivation. And the, another motivation will be uh, when you deploy the system online, probably the user can give you some feedback. For example, uh, the user can navigate around the knowledge base, can help you to find the answer. Then you can collect one example, such a training example in your query log. Yeah. yeah. I think the major motivation will be uh, cheaper data collection. You don't need to uh, hire professional programmers that can understand SQL queries. You can just hire general crowd workers to navigate around the knowledge base to find the answer, to get a training uh, example. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. And there's also a related field of inductive uh, program synthesis, which is basically where you have inputs and outputs. Um, so in this case, you have a query, and then you have an output. In another case, you make up the program's inputs and the program's outputs and try to induce a program uh, in between. So that's like if you're doing test-driven development or something like that, you write your unit test first, and then you just tell the program synthesis engine, hey, synthesize my program, so I don't need to write programs. Uh, like, there, there's lots of examples of this, but they all fall under the weekly supervised thing, which is you don't know the gold standard program, but you know something where if you get the gold standard program right, you'll probably also get the answer. We're, we're about finished, so uh, either of us can take questions afterwards. Yeah.